I'm out, I'm here. Uh, I uh, helped form this group with Katie. Katie, will you wave your hand there, please? There's Katie Hoffman. And um, we've been going since a year ago, January. And we have been here every single week, and we will continue being here every single week. Yay! Yay! Here we go. Um, okay, let me just introduce some people from the group. Stanley, my brother, is on the back. He's what's on the, he loves shirts over the, what over the hill. What when? He loves shirts. Um, he's our videographer, and this will be on video available on uh, the. Greater Cincinnati Dems uh, Facebook and it's on my Facebook and I put it on Facebook and if Steve wants to put it on his Facebook he can do that we've got, we, we do this video thing and it gets to YouTube so it's already there um, okay uh, let's see uh, Pete Rose is Pete here today no. or, no. he's still Alan out of the country is somebody taking Ellen 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 and Marlena will be taking notes. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm the Peter Rose. So, so if you've got an announcement, write it down and clear. I'm, I'll give it to me and I'll put it in the newsletter. So Ellen's going to be your contact there. Get it, get in any cards or any, any information. Now, Ann, anything you want to have about AFTAP can go to her. You understand? Oh, of course. For our newsletter. Yes, I'm going to be there. Yeah. Are you going? Oh, you've already done it. Oh, you're a great person. Johnny Hill. Look at that. Nice. Does that explain the dust cat? This is a duck hat. Guess who's getting the duck hat? Guess who's doing the duck hat? Well, I'm wearing that because I was called. Um, I, I was. You were you the one who called me this weekend? Somebody called me this week from the AFTAP campaign and said, "Could I volunteer to go and do whatever they're doing this week?" And I said. No, I'm leaving for San Diego. I'll be gone to the end of July, uh, January, the end of June. And don't make it worse. Uh, I'm going to the end of June. And um, I said, but you can come to our luncheon and, and make an announcement. And I, I'm hoping that with Anna, because she's working with the AFTAP campaign, and she'll tell you about what's going on in just a minute. Uh, our restrooms are out the back. Let's see. Anybody else we need to introduce? Uh, Bonnie is back there. Are you, do you have your pussy hats and stuff? Yes? yes? Yeah. She has pussy hats. She also has orange hats now, which are the anti-gun things. Uh, the color of the anti-gun program is orange. All right. Um, why? Oh, the color hunters wear so they don't get shot. Oh, the color hunters wear so they don't get shot. No, they Ethel Gutenberg said that was her granddaughter's favorite color. So that's where it came from. Ethel said that specifically on Saturday. Ethel is the grandmother of a, a Cincinnati grandmother of a young woman who was killed in Florida. That's just horrible. She winds up in a lot of anti-gun campaigns. Um, let's see. She often comes to this meeting too. Okay, I want you to make sure it's belly up to our belly up to our bar. There's information in there about other things. We have uh, naturalization ceremonies going on. If you're interested in helping to register, helping to register people to vote, um, that's a really nice way to get. It's like getting it's like sitting ducks votes. I mean, these 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 new citizens are so anxious to vote. It's really satisfying because they are coming to you in droves and trying to get to help get registered to vote. It's really feels so good. I personally have registered over 400 people to vote just since January. But I'm going to be gone in June, and they just added two ceremonies because there are a lot of people who are trying to get... I have to tell you, our number, when we, we used to get 67, they always usually have about 70 people there who are being um, naturalized. And um, we always used to get 61, 65, even 67, once we got 70 out of 70. But now it's going down a little bit. It's like 59, 58, because everybody's bringing in their old aunts and uncles who can't, don't speak English, they don't know how to write in English, um, and they're so afraid of their older relatives being deported that they're bringing them through the system. So I, 
our numbers are going down a little bit in terms of registering people to vote, but it's still very satisfying, folks. And it, it's really not, it's real, try it, you'll like it. Um, let's see, uh, we have this space until two o'clock. You may stay after the meeting. If Steve, who is our speaker, is not smart enough to run away right at one o'clock, uh, he can, he will, you can capture him and you can capture him and kind of ask him additional questions after because I'll stop this thing around one o'clock. But if you can capture him, you can stop. And you are always welcome to stay and talk to each other. We've had a whole bunch of groups come out of this group, which I'm very pleased about. The to amend some people here from the Amos Project. Um, uh, Mike often, often tells us about different things to do with. Uh, the, the criminal justice system. So um, make sure that you're meeting some of the people that you want to meet and find out what's going on in our community. I think it's really important. Okay, let's see. Sid, our youngest Democrat, is here. Um, uh, okay, let's go to announcements. Who has the microphone? Yes. Here we go, Mike. I see a show of hands. Somebody would like to vote on whether we spend public money for the new soccer stadium. How many would like to vote on that rather than just have it? Okay. Well, there's a petition over here. If you live in the city, you can sign. And Katie's going to talk some more about it, but uh, <clears throat> I hope we can vote on it. Um, it will come in November, right? If we get the, night, the right number of signatures on the petition. Just make sure you understand there are two petitions at this time. There is one petition about the total package that was passed through City Council on an emergency ordinance. The rule with emergency ordinances is that you really can't send them to referendum. However, we have had an attorney from outside of Cincinnati that feels that it was not an emergency situation to begin with. So that petition is out there, and that needs the 6,000 plus signatures to make it legal. The second petition is because when they rushed some things through, they forgot the appropriations for the hotel tax. Now, we're looking at the budgets of Cincinnati. You saw the proposed budgets out there, and how many things are being cut? Mental health services, services to the youth, services to the rec centers. All these things are being cut throughout the neighborhoods but yet they want to give the hotel tax of $1.5 million a year so they can help with the maintenance of the FC Cincinnati Stadium. So in other words, that's, and the thing that's so egregious about this one is that it is $1.5 million for 30 years. Ouch. That is the one that is really the one we could probably, it did not go through an emergency, but that is one that at least we can make those billionaires pay for themselves. But the fact is we need this money in our city alone. Yes, if the package is $34 million right now at this time, but the city doesn't have that money. And so they are now going to have to borrow that money and so you and I will now be paying all the interest on that so they now figure out the dollar amount is going to be around 62 million dollars that is going to come out of the taxpayers pockets Ouch. so it's really important if you are a resident of the city of Cincinnati in other words you voted for mayor you voted for Cincinnati City Council that you sign this petition this is not about soccer this is about how it was done the underhanded way it was done that Cranley put a gag order on anybody that was running for city council that you didn't talk about it. Because every single one of those five votes that voted for this package received significant campaign contributions from FC Cincinnati. So it was just a very underhanded way to do something. And they planned from the, from the get-go they wanted the West End. Because that's where these millionaires and their friends could basically expand and make more money. And yes, P.G. Sittenfeld did say there will not be any destruction of the any area around the stadium oh, during construction. 
Mind you, that last little statement, during construction. But we have seen some of the plans that basically you have the stadium and from where District 1 Police Station is all the way down to where the Cincinnati Ballet is on the corner of Liberty and all the way back to John Street, that is going to be the concrete apron around the stadium. So all that housing, the churches who have basically been bought off for their votes, that's going to be gone. That's going to be gone. That's going to be basically, and then they're going to be turning everything into entertainment district. So make sure you understand the, the whole underlying thing. It's not about soccer. It's about how this was done. The underhanded way that this was done. And when somebody goes into a neighborhood and says, if you don't want us here, we won't come here. And they voted, we don't want you here and they pushed everything aside and go in there anyway, you know who these people are. Anybody brave enough to make announcements after that? <laughs> Anna, tell us about AFTAP. I'm not with the AFTAP campaign. I am with the Tuesday work group for AFTAP. Tuesday work group for AFTAP and out of the north side. We meet every Tuesday evening from now until election day when we're going to have a big celebration, right? <laughs> um, and we meet at 6.30 at Chameleon on Hamilton Avenue. And I'm here because I want to invite everyone to march with our group in the Gay Pride Parade on June 23rd. We'll meet at 11 a.m. right behind City Hall on 7th Street. We invite you to get one of these lovely shirts and wear that at the parade and a duck hat. She's selling them for two dollars each. Bargain, wow. folks. And and we will have homemade signs and multicolored lays that we're, we're making all these in our Tuesday group. And we're, we'd like to have at least 150 to 250 people join us so we really have a wave of blue in this parade. Um, and one more thing is everyone is also invited to join us for the July 4th parade in Northside and I don't have enough details on that yet. So thank you. I can make the July, I can do the July 4th one. I'm really excited about wearing my hat. Marlena. Uh, really quickly to go back and piggyback on the petition. Uh, we found out that because I am not a resident of the city, I cannot be a circulator and I had already gotten 25 signatures. But anyway, um, I am now coordinating or helping to coordinate the uh, volunteer effort to get the signatures. So if you're interested, I will provide a link for that in the newsletter or you can see me and I'll give you some dates. Um, and really quickly, a positive thing, I have a lot of leftover plants in my garden. So if anyone would like free tomato plants, basil, there's a cantaloupe and mustard greens, please come to my house and take them. <laughs> oh, that sounds yummy. Wait, 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 we'll get them, we'll get them after, after Juggy here. Uh, uh, love, how's everybody doing? Love this group. Uh, this Friday at the West End AFL-CIO uh, Cope Dinner. Uh, everyone's invited. They got a good band there this year. Oh, her, his band is playing. What's the name of your band? Public Figure. Public Figure. The problem is the tickets are $150, but it's worth it. 75 75 Okay. 175? Just 75. 75. <laughs> Noah. Just one quick. Um, for the Better Angels, for those who've heard about it, we have a workshop coming up on the 16th of this month. If anybody's interested in uh, participating, just come and see me and I'll give you more information. Remind us where it is. The Better Angels, we bring people from the Dems and the Republicans and we try to find common grounds in talking. So it's an all-day um, workshop. It's going to be on Saturday, June 16th, from 10 to 5. For more information, just come and see me, and I'll send you all the information. Can you imagine talking to Republicans? <laughs> In Cincinnati. Dr. Laura. Dr. Laura. I participated in the last uh, Better Angels uh, workshop, and it is a lot of fun. I encourage all of you to, uh, to attend one of these things. It will give you a lot of insight into uh, how Republican wheels spin around. So. We do have common ground with Republicans. We have discovered that. 
Some of them want money out of politics, too. Uh, okay, who's next? Who's next? Okay, uh, that's it. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. So we're going to see. Oh, no, I have one more announcement. Um, on your tables, I have uh, a redistricting news thing that you're welcome to take home. But I, I want you to know about some of the stuff that's going on in the, in the state house here in Ohio. And please look at those four dots there and what these things mean. And uh, um, I think down at the bottom it tells you how, what to do about it. Um, anyway, get to see, get to, I want to keep you familiar with what's going on in the state house because there's some dirty dealings going up there and I really want no. you to be aware. No. Shocker. Okay, well, <laughs> you, you, you of all people need to be aware of what's going on and there are ways to contribute and fight what's going on there. Okay, and with that, with that, I think we're there. Yes, and it wasn't even 20 minutes yet. Without that, I want to introduce a fellow Peace Corps person. I met him recently at a Peace Corps volunteer organization meeting. He has been um, a country director in two different countries in Africa. And I think the neat thing about him is that he's brought kids back to Cincinnati with him. You know, the, the, kids, in, the kids in the program would go, what can I do after Peace Corps? And he said, come to Cincinnati. So he's got this whole group with him. I love it. Without further ado, our elder graduate, Miami University graduate, Steve Treehouse. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to be here with so many Democrats. I'm happy that I am not running for anything. So I'm thrilled to talk to you today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I grew up on the West Side, in a very one of the few Democratic families on the West Side at the time, I think. We're, we're growing in number. I, that's good. That's good. I'm very happy to hear that. I got involved in politics when I was two years old when my dad ran for Congress against Don Clancy uh, in 1968. And so I've been kind of at it ever since. And I describe to people that, you know, my summers and, you know, lead up to election days were passing out literature and working church festivals. And in my family, election day was always a holiday. And I would take off school to work the polls ever since I can remember. Since, you know, like fourth grade, you know, I, I've been working the polls. And I would often work the polls at my school. And so I would see my classmates going to class. They'd be like, where are you? I'm like, well, I'm working the polls. Of course, it's election day. So I kind of grew up in politics here. And I find it really interesting. You know, Tim is stepping down on Saturday. And I recall, you know, the fights between Sako Weethi and, and all those yeah. folks long ago and Sid Weil serving with Sako and, and my dad serving as chair with Bill Mallory for a while. And it's just great to be back here uh, and, and really experiencing a Democratic Party that I think is reinvigorated in Hamilton County. Uh, I don't know how many of you people were at the, the kind of group think that we did, the strategic session with about 300 people. Um, but I think that's one of the most exciting meetings I've been to uh, in Hamilton County amongst Democrats in a very, very long time. And so I am very encouraged by that. I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing amongst local candidates. This judicial slate we have is absolutely outstanding. Uh, I am thrilled with our statewide ticket. I think our statewide ticket is very, very strong. Uh, we have all 99 seats filled uh, running for the House of Representatives, which is near and dear to me, because I served as a state legislator from the west side uh, for eight years from 2000 to 2008. Um, and then we have two outstanding congressional candidates, which I'm also excited about because I happen to hold one of those seats for a couple of years. Um, and so I was up in, in Washington with AFTAB a couple of weeks ago, introducing him to members of Congress. And they were very, very excited about AFTAB's candidacy. Uh, he's a rock star uh, amongst the members there. And it was kind of fun because I got to see some folks that I hadn't seen for a long time, and we were doing a few meetings here and there. I'm like, after what we really want are four votes. 
because then I can go on the floor and I can grab a bunch of members and I can pull you into the cloakroom where all the members just chat and you can meet a bunch of them. So we did that and I think after that was kind of starstruck, um, but I think a lot of the members were starstruck uh, with Aftab and just really excited about his candidacy. And I'm doing the same thing for Jill uh, next week. So, and, and I happen to live in the second congressional district because of gerrymandering. Um, I, my wife and I, when we came back, we wanted to purchase a house in the city of Cincinnati, but I don't know if any of you have tried to purchase a house recently, but I'm just astounded at how quickly houses go and how expensive they are uh, in the city of Cincinnati. So we ended up settling in Finneytown, which I love, um, just a block outside the city of Cincinnati. But unbeknownst to me, I found myself in the second congressional district, which I find amazing being in the middle of Hamilton County, but living in the second congressional district. Ironically, the house that we share a yard with right behind me is where Don Clancy raised his family. And so I tell my mom, I'm like, look, it's Clancy's house. Um, but it's, it's, it's a great neighborhood. It's great to be back. Um, after Congress, as some of you know, uh, I had the opportunity to take my family to Southern Africa. Uh, and I ran the Peace Corps in Swaziland for four and a half years, working to combat HIV and AIDS and do education around sexual reproductive health. Uh, it's a tragic situation in Swaziland. 31% um, of all adults are HIV positive. Uh, that number gets up to about 50% amongst young women and pregnant women. And it's a population of only a million people. So you can imagine the impact this has had on the society of Swaziland. Um, but we had just a wonderful experience. Uh, my kids now refer to Swaziland as home. And so my daughter was just there, said she had to go home, and so she, she went home for a little while. Um, and then we had the opportunity to go to Morocco for a year and a half and, and run the Peace Corps in Morocco. So that's what I've been doing for the last six years. And we came back uh, almost a year ago in June, and I was wondering what I wanted to do with my life. I, I was still knew I wanted to be involved in international things, and I wanted to be involved in politics and public policy. And so I began a firm with my cousin Bob Driehaus, who was a reporter for many years uh, with Cincinnati Post and with WCPO, and with Kevin Ty, who some of you might know, who's worked on quite a few campaigns locally. Um, doing public policy. So I'm working on public policy initiatives and we're also working with quite a few uh, campaigns. We're probably working on, I don't know, eight or nine campaigns at this point in different capacities. Those being statewide campaigns, state legislative races, congressional races, uh, local races, judicial. Um, so it's, it's exciting. It's exciting to be back involved. And I'm excited at what I'm seeing within the party and the change. Um, Tim's done a wonderful job over the past 25 years and uh, he deserves you know, our gratitude because it is a thankless job. As I mentioned, my dad did this and, and I, I know how thankless that job is. Um, but you know, I, I am excited that it's time for change in Hamilton County. I think we are working toward a party that's far more reflective of the people, the population of Hamilton County. And I hope that we will see a lot of young leadership stepping up and taking on responsibility. Uh, because as I often say, I think the, the future of the Democratic Party is younger, it's, it's people of color, and it's women. And, and so I'd like to encourage as much of that engagement as possible. So I, I'm excited to be back. Uh, I'm also running uh, an initiative called Cincinnati Compass which was uh, a brainchild of the mayor several years ago, and he stated that he wanted to see Cincinnati become the most welcoming city for immigrants in the United States, uh, which is a tall order. Um, that vision was embraced by the Chamber of Commerce, uh, and about 60 community partners came together to create um, what's called Cincinnati Compass. Uh, Cincinnati Compass, existed only as a website, a portal with a bunch of information for quite some time. And then three months ago, I was hired on as executive director and uh, Brian Wright, my colleague, came on as uh, managing director. 
And the idea of compass is, is threefold in my mind. First of all, it's to advocate on behalf of immigrant and immigrant families here in Greater Cincinnati, um, to, to be a response to the craziness that you too often hear in the media, coming from presidential tweets to Bill Cunningham on WW or whatever it might be, but to provide a rational response around immigration and advocate on behalf of immigrants because they contribute so greatly uh, to our society and to our culture here in Greater Cincinnati. The second part of that is promoting uh, what immigrants have done here in Greater Cincinnati. Um, if you just look at the chili parlors alone, <laughs> it's all immigrants. But there are so many tremendous contributions being made economically and culturally by the immigrant community, and we need to celebrate that. I mean, how many of you know that we have 10,000 people from Bhutan living here? Well, there you go. More than a typical room, I can tell you that. Um, but it, it, this has been such an amazing opportunity for me because I meet the Bhutanese, and then, you know, I, I, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal, so I love interacting with the Senegalese. We have a huge Senegalese community here. Uh, the the Congolese, um, just you name it. They're, they're countries from all over the world represented here in Greater Cincinnati, and we need to celebrate it. So that's another part of our mission. And then finally, connecting immigrants to services that are provided to them locally uh, to assist them. You know, to assist them with housing, to assist them with small business startup, to navigate the school system, to, you know, access, you know, a plethora of resources available to them, and then to identify where there are gaps in those services and build the capacity uh, where it's necessary. So that's a big initiative that I've been working on, that I will continue to work on for quite some time. And I'm excited because I think it's long overdue. There are many cities across the United States that have welcoming initiatives uh, for immigrants, but we haven't in Cincinnati. I don't know why, but I'm glad that we do now. So I hope that you'll see many things coming up around you know, festivals, celebrations, you know, letters to the editor, news programs about immigrants. And quite frankly, this community, Greater Cincinnati, owes all of its growth in the last decade to immigration. The only way we grow, and we've grown, we've grown a little bit, not as much as Franklin County, but Cincinnati, next to Franklin County, is the high growth area in the state of Ohio. That's due entirely to immigrants. All of the small business startups, you know, all the Main Street businesses, almost entirely immigrants. You know, the, the economic growth we're seeing due to immigration. We need to celebrate that. But unfortunately, I find when I talk to immigrant families, people that are scared, people that are scared to death that ICE is going to be knocking on the door, whether they're documented or undocumented, it doesn't matter. You know, they, they live in fear of being pulled over by that police officer and what that might mean for their family. You know, there are kids that are afraid to go to school because they're afraid that when they come home they might not find their parents there. And that's tragic. And of course, the, the absolute insanity of what's going on at the border of separating families. And, and when they dehumanize this, it's really, really disturbing. So when you hear people talk about chain migration, you know what chain migration is? It's families. It's about, we used to celebrate family unification. There is nothing wrong with celebrating family unification. That is a good thing. That is not a bad thing. So if you're here and you're able to bring your spouse or your children or your parents, that is the American dream, folks. Since when did that become a dirty word? And so when we allow them, to talk about chain migration. That's just absurd. And then when they talk about the lottery, as if the lottery is like the Ohio lottery, right? You win the Ohio lottery and boom, you get to move to the United States. The lottery system is a system that we put in place for years, allowing people the opportunity to come to the United States if they meet a host of criteria. And we talk about vetting, they are vetted. I don't know if any of you have ever met with a consular officer of the United States Embassy overseas 
It is not easy. It is tremendously intimidating. They're going to ask you a bunch of questions. They're going to ask for a bunch of information to make sure that you're on the up and up. And when you go to the United States, you're going to be contributing to our society. And they do. And the fact of the matter is, is that immigrants tend to be better educated than the average American. And they tend to be very industrious. They tend to start up businesses more than the average American. So I'm here to celebrate the immigrants in our community. I hope you join us in that effort. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm thrilled to be back here during an election cycle that I think is very exciting, and I'd be happy. I'm going to stop talking. I'll just take questions. I served with Rich Cordray in multiple capacities. Um, I served with Rich when he was Attorney General and I was a state representative. We encouraged Ted Strickland to start a housing task force, which Rich and I served on. Rich and I worked with John Husted and Kevin DeWine, two Republicans. It was the four of us created a bipartisan redistricting initiative in 2007. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, my Demo this was our fault, by the way. So Rich and I worked with DeWine and Husted, not the same DeWine, but it's, it's his uncle or something. Um, and we came up with a redistricting plan, which we thought was outstanding, which gave the Democrats, and, and it had as one of the criteria, not only the normal stuff of keeping communities whole and jurisdictions whole and things like that, but we factored in their competitiveness. We said that it's very, very important for districts to be competitive. And we had definitions for competitiveness that had to be included in the drawing of lines. In 2007, we took this to the powers that be in the Democratic Party, the state of Ohio. And you'll recall in 2006, the Democrats did quite well in the state of Ohio. So that's when Strickland won and we took all but one of the statewide seats. And we were on our way to a majority in the House two years later. So we took this proposal to our friends, our labor friends, so, and I love labor, love labor. But we were so heady with the election results of 2006, so sure of ourselves that we would be holding those same offices in 2010 when the census took place and we would have to redraw the districts, that they said, no, 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 no. We're going to have the power of the pen. We'll redraw the lines. And that attempt at fair districts in 2007 fell by the wayside because of it. And because of that hubris, really, uh, we have the districts today that we have, the congressional districts and the state legislative districts. Ooh. So that when I served in Congress under Republican-drawn districts, when I served in Congress, I believe, I'm not sure of this, I want to say we had 18 districts, 18 congressional districts, and it was something like 12 to 6, was it, was it 16? There's 16 now. There's 16 now. There were, there were 18 then. We lost two in the census. Um, and I want to say that it was 12 to 6, Democrats, Republicans. This was under Republican drawn districts. To what it is today, there are only 12 three, Republicans. Right, but only four Democrats in the entire state. Yep. Which is absurd that we have four Democratic representatives in Congress from the state of Ohio. So, uh, I'm glad that we are making improvements to that. I think the Republicans see the handwriting on the wall. And I think you also see, we are toward the end of the decade, and these districts become more and more competitive toward the end of the decade. Because they're drawn to protect incumbents at the beginning of the decade. And due to population shifts that occur during the course of several years, you find that the some of these districts that weren't necessarily competitive in 2000 or 2002 or 2004 become competitive, you know, in eight or ten or you know later on in the decade. So that's what happens. Um, I'll leave it at that, and I am happy to talk about immigration. I'm happy to talk about Peace Corps. I'm happy to talk about politics, Congress, whatever. So I will open it up to questions. Yes, sir. That's just the what you're talking about immigration. Um, I Oh, yeah, it's right here. I'll speak to you.
Uh oh. That's dangerous. Okay, how's that? That's great. Um, I happen, I'm a home care nurse, mm -hmm. and I happen to see a lot of Nepalis. Uh -huh. Amazing people. Um, I'm a Jew, and I'm considered a spiritual man at 13. Nepali community, eight years old. Eight years old. That's how important spirituality is to them. But one of the places I go to is a huge uh, condo complex, apartment complex, got tons of houses everywhere. And I met the woman that runs it, she's run it for 19 years. She said that when someone comes here to get an apartment, you have to have a job. So these people are coming here and they don't have jobs. Mm -hmm. So someone in the community sponsors them. Right. Two weeks later, they go, they find a job. A little while later, they save up enough money and they buy a home, okay? And she went through the list, and I don't have the proper order, but first it was the Guatemalans, and that happened. Then it was Mexicans, and that happened. Then it was all the different people from Africa, and that happened. Then it was the Indians. And it was the same thing over and over and over again. They found jobs, became productive members of our society, and along with it, they left the worst of what they had behind and brought the best with them. Uh, culture, family, you know, work ethic, everything. It's amazing. But that's the Nepali community I know now. Is it in Westwood? It's Westwood. Um, yeah. I'm so bad on location. Well, the Bhutanese, it was, that's similar, yeah. Well, it's the same. The, the Nepalese population is actually, uh, many of them are refugees from Bhutan. They're yes. of Nepalese descent. Yes. yes. They lived in Bhutan for generations. There was a religious persecution <clears throat> in Bhutan, and so they resettled here as refugees. Yes. Now, what also happens, especially in the Bhutanese community, the Nepalese community, is that there were probably about 1,500 or 2,000 people resettled as refugees, but then there were other Bhutanese in the United States who see their friends and relatives doing successfully in Cincinnati, and they come and join them. Yes. And so that community has grown to about 10,000 people from that initial 1,500 or 2,000. The vast majority of immigrants coming to greater Cincinnati are secondary migrants, meaning they first migrated to New York or Chicago or Miami or one of those other cities. They found those cities to be very expensive. Um, they often didn't know, they weren't well connected in those cities. They learn of a family or friends that live in greater Cincinnati. They learn about job opportunities and schools and they relocate to Cincinnati. That's how many immigrants get to Cincinnati. I wanted to add one other thing, and I, again, I'm, this is the first time I've been here, so if I'm out of line, please tell me to shut up. Um, I was, thank you. Um, I was at dinner last night with family friends, and a gentleman came, we were having a good political discussion about he who shall be nameless, and um, a gentleman came up, he was from New York originally, actually had dealings with he who shall be nameless, and was very influential or knew a lot about the higher up in the Republican Party. And he said something very interesting. He said the goal of the party was to keep people from voting. Yeah. And it was interesting that in this last election we had 149,000 more Republicans voted than Democrats here. And what he said was that with, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm able, I don't know politics, so this may all be known to all of you, but he was saying that as long as they keep on stirring up, you know, with the news media and everything, and as long as the Democratic Party remains silent, no one's going to do anything. They've given up. And that's what the Republican Party is counting on. And I thought it was interesting because I can't tell, like nationally, who's going to represent us? Who's telling us what a democratic policy is in the national news? And even if it would be, even if he's not going to run, like a Biden or someone, to, to every day get out there and say, this is who we are as Democrats, you have forgotten us. But this man knew things and had been to the Republican higher-up parties. 
and he said they are just celebrating, and they don't think they have a thing to worry about. Uh, we think we've got it because of the idiot. We think we've got it, but because of their strategies that they've had in place for years, he says we got a lot of work to do. Yeah, a few things. I don't necessarily believe in the blue wave. Um, I've seen wave elections. This could be a wave election. Uh, but there's a long way between now and November. Um, in terms of the primary turnout between Republicans and Democrats in the state of Ohio, I think that had a lot more to do with the Trump versus anti-Trump movement within the Republican Party. Uh, there's a huge divide in the Republican Party. The primary, the gubernatorial primary brought that out. And I think that's why you saw greater uh, enthusiasm around uh, voting in the Republican primary in the state of Ohio. I don't think it's necessarily a reflection of the political demographics in the state, and I think we read far too much into special elections and primary elections. Uh, I, I think you know all the prognosticators like to go through those numbers. It's really challenging to, to draw too much out of those races, which we always do. Um, finally, on voter suppression, that started back when I was in the state legislature in the early 2000s. We saw a lot of efforts around voter ID, uh, you know, so voter ID laws, um, you know, reducing the number of precincts, making the voting places further away uh, from the actual voters, um, restricting uh, the days that you can, elect, you know, vote at the Board of Elections, um, and just so many restrictive efforts. And clearly, this was aimed at low-income and minority voters, no doubt about it. And we said it time and time and time again. Um, this all comes from, there's an organization called ALEC. And, and ALEC uh, is very, very effective in uh, promoting conservative, the conservative agenda. And that's why you see these issues come up in different states at the same time. You know, who was talking about transgender bathrooms? When, when did that become an issue? That become an issue because somebody at Alec brought it up. They get, and what they actually do, they give them model legislation, and they say, "Here is the bill. Take the bill back to your state, make the necessary changes, and introduce it." So all of these this legislation is introduced almost simultaneously in multiple states from guys that went to Alec. Uh, and then finally, when it comes to leadership, this is always a challenge for the party that's out of power when it comes to the president. Um, who is our leader? You know, I can name 10, 15 people that might be running for president of the United States on the Democratic side. Well, who among them is leading the Democratic Party? Well, we're, we're leaderless at the moment. And so we turn to people like, you know, candidates for governor and, and statewide and local candidates to lead us. Because we don't have that national leadership. Um, I don't think, you know, the minority leaders in the House and Senate are, are necessarily the leaders that we need to represent us, you know, nationwide. And so I think you'll see a leader emerge uh, amongst the many primary candidates uh, that we're going to be seeing over the next couple of years. Just an FYI, we talked about Alec. You know who the number one contributor is to that Alec campaign? Anheuser-Busch. Do you know who has the MLS franchise contract for all FC for the FC Cincinnati Stadium? Anheuser Busch. Who has you know when you go to a Bengals football game, you go down there. Anheuser Busch. So they've got huge amount of impact, and they're every day. I mean, they're right there beside you every single day. Drink local beer. Drink local beer. That's right. Oh, hi. I just wanted to comment. Uh, I volunteer uh, at a primary school in Winton Woods. Mm -hmm. That's a huge uh, school district. Uh, that primary school represents 23 different nations at that, wow. that one school. What's the name of the school? That's pri well, they have two primary schools. I, I, the right. I do the primary north. It used to be called Beachwood. So. Uh -huh. But anyway, uh, it, it, but if you go around the neighborhoods, you'll understand that oh, yeah. uh, we are a you know, multi-cultural area, but if you go in someplace, I hate to say the word west side, but if you went someplace where they're 
all Caucasians, you don't even notice it. Well, and that's not the case on the west side. Well, that's good. Go to Dater High School. Okay. Go to Roberts Academy. Oh, okay. um, you, there's tremendous international inclusion on the west side these days. Go to College Hill. And, and actually, on, and why I mentioned Westwood is because the corridor, uh, to the extent that you're familiar with the corridor on Queen City Avenue, moving up, Westwood has always been known in the city of Cincinnati as the neighborhood with the most rental property for years. Um, and much of that apartment housing is located on Queen City Avenue as you're going up the hill. Well, for first generation immigrants from Africa, they go there. They locate there all the time until they do exactly what you said. You know, save up, purchase a house, get a job, and, and then move out. But many, many African immigrants settle there in, in Westwood along Queen City Avenue. I want to thank you for all your public service. It's incredible what you've done, and your family. Thanks. Who do you think will be our uh, presidential candidates next? <laughs> hey, your guess, your guess is as good as mine. Who, who, would, who would you like to see, or who would you bet on? Well, look, you know, I love Joe Biden, but I think Joe's a little old. Uh, I think Kamala Harris looks uh, really strong. Um, <laughs> Tim Ryan is spending a lot of time in Iowa and New Hampshire, and I see him when I go to Washington, and I love Tim. Go to Iowa. Um, I, don't, I, I honestly don't know. I, well, she was the Attorney General, Kamala Harris, she was the Attorney General in California. She's now a United States Senator. Uh, very well spoken, very smart. Uh, very aggressive when it comes to taking on Trump and the administration. Um, she's doing a great job. She's making a great name for herself. And she would be a very, very impressive, a lot of people are mentioning her. Um, so it's, it's not just coming from me. Uh, what do you think about Joe Kennedy? I like Joe Kennedy. He's a nice guy. He's young. Joe, my, my former chief of staff and my former legislative director are the chief of staff and legislative director for Joe Kennedy. Um, so I know the Kennedy's office pretty well. Uh, Joe's a good guy. He's too young. I, I don't think. Eh, I, you know, I, Joe's doing a good job where he is. And Joe's a great voice in Congress. The thing about the Kennedys that I, I don't think most people know this is that the Republicans always want to work with the Kennedy. So the way you pass bipartisan legislation in the Congress is get a Republican to work with the Kennedy, because they love having a Kennedy on, you know, on the bill. Um, so Joe's very popular. I think Joe's doing a good job. Joe's become a real strong voice, a passionate voice, I think, uh, especially around the, the socially progressive moral issues relative to things like immigration and poverty and, and tax you know, uh, treatment. Um, I think Joe's become a real, a real voice of conscience, and, and that's good. Hi, I wanted to ask about um, separation of families at the border. Now, occasionally I'll hear that, you know, some of these Republicans will claim that the same kind of thing happened under the Obama administration. And could you explain what is happening now versus what was happening under the Obama administration? It's not my understanding that the same type of aggressive separation of families was happening under the Obama administration. However, I will say that ICE dramatically stepped up its enforcement efforts under the Obama administration. That is true. And uh, I think that's very unfortunate. Uh, but that's true. But this policy of separating children from their parents, um, the Attorney General and others have said quite candidly that it's meant to discourage families from entering the United States. And it's, it is the prerogative of the administration to pursue it in such a, I don't know, aggressive manner. And that's what we're seeing. Um, what are your plans for changing the message and messaging about the contributions immigrants are making and have made? And, um, you know, how do you counter the airwaves? Well, being a good politician, I want to run a campaign. So I want to campaign around immigrants all over greater Cincinnati. So, you know, I want the faces of immigrants on posters saying, I am an immigrant, and then talk about the tremendous accomplishments they've made in greater Cincinnati and how they've contributed. You know, people that you would know, people that you run into, 
uh, people that are doctors. Both the president of the University of Cincinnati and the president of NKU are both immigrants. You know, we have, right, so, but, but I mean, we have restaurant owners, business people, we have just, personally, we have story after story after story. And so what we're doing is we've created an advisory board of 25 people. And those 25 people will have about six committees. One of those committees will be about promotion and, and marketing. And, and so we are also bringing in people into those committees to assist us with that. So I expect to have about 150, 200 people working on this initiative. So it's not just me and Brian. It, there's about 150 or 200 of us that are going to be working on this. And so a big part of that's going to be promotion. And so I, I intend to run a campaign. But I've also been out there on the radio right, doing op-eds, things like that, um, when it comes to you know, immigrants. So, and we're going to continue to do that. I don't get my own time on WLW, but you know, I'll call in and take on Bill anytime. Food. Food? Food. Well, and, and what you do is, the food in all these houses is just, I know a little bit. Well, let me tell you, the food is really good, and it'd be interesting to take the different immigrant cultures Come up with a food, put it out in the public for like a weekend with the Nepalis or wherever. But then also, if you want to make some money to put back into the community, I mean, every church, every synagogue, every everything always has the cookbook. So you could actually, with each one of those weekends, you could actually make a Nepali cookbook, sell it, and then put some money back into the group. That's just a silly idea. Glad, that's not silly at all. Um, there's, there's a thing called Finley Kitchen down at the Finley Market. And it's a great resource uh, for the community to go in and use what is an industrial kitchen. What we would like to do, and this is just some of the ideas we've been throwing around, is sell a subscription to some, so like, just like you would buy a subscription to the symphony. You would get a subscription to Finley Kitchen for, let's say, a series of eight dinners uh, of different cultures where the dishes are made in front of you, you learn how to make the dishes, and then you eat the dishes um, of different cultures. And you can do a one-off, you can do two, you can buy the whole series and participate. And then what I'd like to do is also, I would like to make videos of those so that we can then publicize that through video as well. We're also talking about creating an international marketplace. So again, similar to Finley Market, and there's more actually, there are more immigrants in Finley Market than you might know. Um, there are a lot of immigrant-owned businesses in the market. But we're thinking about creating an international marketplace for Cincinnati that's not just around food, but it's, it's music, it's all kind of crafts, it's you know, different products that are brought in um, from, from all across the world. So we're, I've been running, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in my head thinking about different parts of the city, you know, and we have so many of these old business corridors that are long. It's tough. Development is tough in Cincinnati because we're an old city. And the way we developed, we have a lot of very long business corridors along our major arteries. So when you get the big box retailers coming in and the big box hardware stores and things like that, so many of the small businesses closed along those corridors. So what we're envisioning is bringing back one of those corridors through international businesses. If we can create incentives to create an international marketplace and a place where you can come and you can eat great food, you can listen to international you know, music, you can purchase things, I, I think that would be really cool. And it would be a destination uh, in Cincinnati for, for people interested in international affairs. Fantastic. The, um, I heard you say that the future of the Democratic Party is minorities, women, youth. I think so. I think the future is the same as the past, it's economic. I think that the, uh, what makes us a, a majority is 99 versus 1%, and that's basically economics. I think as long as we take that 99% and break it up into gender, well, we use about seven different categories to break it up. Guns, God, gays, gender, race. And as long as we keep breaking it up into those categories, we're going to keep losing. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, did he win 10 elections? Well, maybe four. What was it? Four. Several. <laughs> right. He had the coalition 
that the Democrats ought to keep, and it was based on economics. It wasn't based on race, gender, age, any of that. So I don't hear enough about economics from anybody. I, I do not disagree with you at all. We, we and, and I think I'm part of this. We practice identity politics way too much. Um, and one of, I think- We're losing with it. Well, and I think one of our big failings, which we saw in the Clinton campaign, quite frankly, was that you've got a bunch of elect, this is the crazy thing. So I'm in Congress. I'm, you know, busting it to, to come up with policies. I remember. No, no, but so, so you're fine. So you've got a bunch of Democratic members of Congress who are really killing themselves to, to create policies and, and vote on policies which benefit these very families that we then can't go out and talk to that don't relate. And so I think that you absolutely tap into something that's critical to the Democratic Party is that we need to know how to relate to the people we're trying to serve. And if we're not doing that, then you're not going to be a very effective representative. If you do with economics, you combine all of those groups. Absolutely. And everybody gets over, except the 1%. But the 1% is good at keeping us divided, and the Democrats cooperate with it. No, I, I think you're right. It, it, it's always about economics. Always, right. So add that to your category of what the Democrats ought to do in the future. Well, that's certainly what we should be working on. How? One more? Uh, okay. Uh, you mentioned Alec, and yeah. there was something where there's another group like Alec called Christian Nationalism. I can't remember the name of it, but that's that's how they describe them as like now they're going to be the next wave where Alec targeted businesses and corporate whatever. I mean that's their focus, economics I guess, and the other one is going a different direction, but they kind of work. And I just didn't know if you knew about that. Or I'm not familiar with it, but if they are doing that, that's going to further divide the Republican Party. Uh, I mean, it, there are a lot of Republicans trying to figure out. I mean, did you hear what John Boehner said the other day? I mean, there are a lot of Republicans in Cincinnati trying to figure out where they belong in the Republican Party. Because they're looking at this saying, this is not our party. And, and they're kind of dumbfounded that all of their elected representatives that they voted for for years have just came. Uh, you know, the, the Jeff Flakes of the world are few and far between. Um, but there are a lot of people that feel like Jeff Flake, but just are afraid to get up and say it, especially if they're office holders. Um, but I think the reason you've seen such democratic success uh, in recent elections, especially in special elections, is because the Republicans are just staying home because they don't recognize the party anymore. So to the extent that they do stuff like this, it further divides the party. I, I don't think either one of the parties at this point are very strong. I, I, don't, neither, I think the Democrats have the momentum, but I don't see either one of the parties being extremely strong. What do you think AFSTAB's chances are? I think it's a really tough district. You know, when I represented that district, it had a sliver, a, more than a sliver. It had about a third of Butler County. Yeah. And I had about 75% of Hamilton County and most of the city of Cincinnati. Uh, the district is now only about half of Hamilton County. They've taken out areas like Woodlawn, Silverton, uh, Kennedy Heights, Springfield Township where I live. Um, so a lot of Democratic strongholds were taken out. And they added all of Warren County. Warren, County, Warren County here is tough. Warren County stuff. So, I, I've spoken to AFTAB a million times about this. I'm, the, I'm always the pessimist with him because everybody's blowing smoke, you know, with AFTAB saying he's the next coming. And I'm like, look, AFTAB, let me bring you back down to earth. This is a damn difficult race. This is a really, really tough district. What he needs, the only, it's winnable. It's winnable if the Democratic base comes out in droves. In an off-year election, we're not, we don't have a great reputation for this. So in an off-year election, the Democratic base comes out in droves, and we swing enough women in Warren County, and, and actually, compare AFTAB to Shabbat, I think there should be a lot of women voting for AFTAB. <laughs> um, 
And, but he needs something like he needs something like 38 percent of the vote in yeah. Warren County, and a tremendous turnout uh, amongst Democrats in Hamilton County. So is it winnable? Yes. And they've got polling that suggests it's a really a dead heat. And he certainly has the attention of the folks in Washington. Uh, and and you know we haven't seen this much excitement I think around a Democratic congressional campaign since I ran. <laughs> and, and, and I don't have to, you know, I said, look, you're a much better candidate than I am. When in, in this race, in this district, you are a much better candidate than I am. And so, you know, have at it. You're a great candidate. He, he is a great candidate. Yeah. I was at a party with uh, Aftab, and he was he was telling stories. He was invited to a mom's luncheon out there, or a mom's coffee out in Warren County. And he said, oh crap, you know, I'm going to go to this place and there's going to be all these men and they're going to be at the bar and they're going to be throwing things at me and yelling insults. Well, he gets to the door, closed for the day. He goes in there and it's women, wall-to-wall -wall women, and they stand up for half So, women in Warren County, Shabbat bring it. Shabbat's in for a rude awakening. Yeah. In Warren. And I, I, think that, I think the support for Shabbat in Warren County is about that deep. Yeah. Joe. <laughs> One more, Jeff. Uh, I don't have a question. I wasn't here earlier. Um, my brother had a medical procedure, and I had to be the responsible person there. <laughs> but I wanted to make an announcement, sure. if I may. Uh, the Jewish Community Relations Council is having their annual meeting on June 19th from 7 to 9 p.m. Their theme is United Against Hate. Their keynote, keynote speaker is going to be Christian. Picciolini, I'm probably saying that wrong. He is the award-winning television producer, public speaker, author, peace advocate, and former violent extremist. He is at 14. He was our. He went from a native teenager to a white supremacist, and soon the leader of America's first neo-Nazi skinhead gang. But 20 years ago, he turned his back on the movement he helped build, and is now dedicated to helping others lead hate movements. So he will be their keynote speaker. I do have handouts, and at the bottom of this handout is a uh, uh, the link to if you want to attend this event. Uh, it's, and again, it's on June 19th from 7 to 9 p.m. Okay, Jeff. Sorry to interrupt with an announcement, but I thought he was an important announcement. But Steve, you are great. I hope it all happens. Thank you so much for being with us today. I think you got a good, um, I have a couple things that I want to show you. I don't. Um, this was this was brought from 2008, and it was brought over by Nick today because he knew you were coming. These are no, no, not a gift to you. It's not a gift to you. Is, I think this is his. It's up to him for his to give. But this says, Vote Freedom First, NRA, Steve Shabbat. Turn it over. Vote Freedom First, Defend Freedom, NRA, Defeat Obama. Oh it. If it comes on our newspaper again, I'm going to just, I'm going to stop my, I, I hope not. I hope not. This is yours. You can do with it as you please. Anyway, thank you so much for coming today. You are a great speaker. You are a great audience. Thank you so much for being here. We have to get the food. Remember, the food comes. If anything that's left, get rid of the rice. There's two kinds of rice that are good for you. Um, let's see, finish off the food. Thank you so much for being a wonderful, wonderful audience. You are great. I love your questions. You are great people. Thank you for coming.